Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now, if you look at this, the Nobel Prize, the most coveted prize, okay? the Nobel Prize retains its luster because errors of the first kind according to Merton, where scientific work of dubious or inferior uh, worth has been mistakenly honored are uncommonly few, yet limitations of the second kind cannot be avoided. The small number of awards means that particularly in times of great scientific practices, there will be many occupants of a particular prize. Okay? And the kind of gap that is created if you look at the, the kind of gap that is created in the award of the ultimate prize is only partly filled by other awards for scientific accomplishment since these do not carry the same prestige either inside the scientific community or outside it. Furthermore, what has been noted about the artifact of fixed numbers producing occupants of the most coveted or one of the most coveted prizes or awards holds in principle for other awards providing less prestige though sometimes these days more cash. Sometimes reflecting on the stratification because we live in a stratified society, hierarchical society. Okay? Reflecting on the stratification of honor and esteem in the world of science uh, uh, know all this, the, the Nobel laureates included in the, uh, in the study carried out by Merton and Jackerman um, that uh, the, the, they themselves know and emphasize it and the members of the uh, Swedish Royal Academy of Science and the Royal Caroline Institute who face the unenviable task of making the final decisions know it. Okay? In the stratification system of honor in science, there may also be a ratchet effect. Okay? Operating in the careers of scientists such that once having achieved a particular degree of eminence, they do not uh, uh, later fall much below that level, although they may be uh, out distanced by newcomers uh, uh, and so uh, suffer a relative decline in prestige. Once a Nobel laureate, always a Nobel laureate according to Merton, I am just quoting Merton here, once a Nobel laureate, always a Nobel laureate. Okay? Yet, the reward system based on recognition for work accomplished, uh, work accomplished tends to induce uh, con continued effort which serves both to validate the judgment that the scientist has unusual capacities and to testify that these capacities have continuing potential. What appears from below to be the summit becomes in, uh, in the experience of those who have reached it only another way station. The scientist's peers <coughs> and other associates regard each of his scientific achievements as only the prelude to new and greater achievements. Such social pressures do not often permit those who have climbed the rugged mountains of scientific achievement to uh, remain content. It is not necessarily the fact that their own uh, fossil aspirations are ever escalating that keeps eminent scientists at work. More and more is expected of them and this, and, and this, this, uh, this more and more is expected of them creates uh, its own measure of motivation and stress. Okay? Less often than might be imagined uh, is the 
uh, repose at the top in science. The, recogni the recognition accorded uh, a scientific achievement by the scientist's peers is a reward in the strict sense uh, uh, identified uh, by Talcott Parsons. As, we'll, uh, as, as, as we shall discuss, uh, such recognition can be converted into an instrumental asset uh, as enlarged facilities are made available to the honored scientific, scientist for further work. Without deliberate intent on the part of any group, the reward system thus influences a uh, class structure of science okay? uh, by providing a stratified distribution of chances or opportunities okay, among scientists for enlarging the, their role as investigators. Okay? What is that class structure in science? I mean, uh, if you if you use uh, 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 Marxist notion of class, that classes are manifestations of economic differentiation. And such differentiation in terms of rewards and recognition has led Merton to conceptualize such class structure uh, of science uh, by providing a stratified uh, distribution of opportunities or chances. Okay? The process, this such, such process of uh, class structure of science provides differential access to the means of scientific production. And this becomes all the more important in the current historical shift from little science to big science. Uh, if you look at uh, Derek D. J. Sola Price's work on little science, big science, uh, of course, this is not a part of this course, but, uh, but one can look at Sola Price's uh, work on uh, little science, big science uh, and such, such in such circumstance, I mean such instance becomes all the more important in the current historical shift uh, from little science to big science with its expensive and often centralized equipment needed for research. There is a continuing interplay between the status system based on honor and esteem and the class system based on differential life chances, Weberian term life chances and causal components while determining a class social class, okay? which, is, which locates science in differing positions within the opportunity uh, structure of science. I mean then the, the status system is based on honor and esteem and class system is based on differential life chances. Okay? If we come, back, come to the second point, if you look at the slide that uh, uh, after reward system in science, we are going to discuss the Matthew effect in the reward system. The second point, the Matthew effect in the reward system. Okay? Uh, in this case, I mean the social structure of science provides the context, context for this inquiry into a complex psychosocial process that affects both the reward system and the communication system in science. Let us, let us start by noting a theme that runs through the interviews which, which Martin and Jackerman uh, uh, carried out with uh, the Nobel laureates. They repeatedly observed that eminent scientists get disproportionately great credit for their contributions to science, while relatively unknown scientists tend to get disproportionately little credit for comparable contributions. As one, uh, I am I'm, I'm, I'm quoting uh, uh, this interview. Uh, carried out by, I mean, uh, it was conducted by both Martin and Jackerman, that as one Nobel laureate in physics put it, the world is peculiar in this matter of how it gives credit. I mean, the world is peculiar, the society is peculiar in this uh, matter of how it gives credit. It tends to give the credit to already famous people. And those who are less famous, they, they, those who do not have so, so much of name and fame, okay, they also get disproportionately lit, little credit. Okay. As we examine the experiences reported by eminent scientists, we find that this pattern of recognition skewed in favor of the established scientist appears principally first in cases of collaboration 
and secondly in cases of independent multiple discoveries made by scientists of distinctly different ranks. In papers co-authored by individuals of decidedly unequal reputation, another laureate in physics reports the man who is best known gets more credit and inordinate amount of credit. In the words of a laureate in chemistry, uh, when people see my name on a paper, they are apt to remember it and not to remember the other names. And a laureate in physiology and medicine describes his, uh, her or his own pattern of response to jointly authored papers. Let me quote this that you usually notice the name that you are familiar with. Even if it is last, it will be uh, the one that sticks. In some cases, all the names are unfamiliar to you and they are virtually anonymous. But what you note is the acknowledgement at the end of the paper to the senior person for his advice and encouragement. So, you will say this came out of uh, Green's lab or so and so's lab. You remember that rather than the long list of authors. Almost as though uh, C or he had been listening to this account, another laureate in medicine explains why C or he will often not put her or his name on the published report of a collaborative piece of work. Let me quote again that people are more or less tempted to say, oh yes, so and so okay, is working uh, on so, uh, such and such in XYZ's laboratory. Okay? It is XYZ's idea. I try to cut that down. Still another laureate in medicine alludes to this pattern and goes on to observe how it might prejudice the career of the junior investigator. If someone is being considered for a job by people who have not had uh, much experience with him or her, if she or he has published only together with some known names, well it detracts. It naturally makes people ask how much is really her or his own contribution, how much the senior authors, how will she or he work, work out uh, once she or he goes out of this that laboratory. Okay? That is why this, this uh, uh, collective spirit of work also tends to influence uh, the credit system, I mean the reward system. Under certain conditions, this adverse effect on recognition of the junior authors or uh, junior author of papers written in collaboration with prominent scientists can apparently be countered and even converted into an asset. Should the younger scientist for Martin move ahead to do autonomous and significant work, this work retro retroactively uh, affects the appraisal of her or his role in earlier collaboration. In the words of the laureate in medicine who returned to the virtual anonymity of junior authors of co-authored papers, I am quoting now, people who have, who have been identified with such joint work and who often go on to do work later on do get the proper amount of recognition. Indeed, as another laureate implies, this retroactive judgment may actually heightened recognition for later accomplishments. That is, the junior person is sometimes uh, lost sight of, but only temporarily if C or he continues. In many cases, C or he actually gains in, in acceptance of her or his work and in general acceptance by having once had such association. Awareness of this pattern of retroactive recognition may account in part for the preference described by another laureate of some young fellows who feel that to have a better known name on the paper will be of help to them. But this is an expressive as well as a merely instrumental preference as we see also in the pride of which laureates themselves speak of having worked with their mentors, the mentors of those Nobel laureates. So much for the misallocation of credit in this reward system in the case of collaborative work. Such misallocation also occurs 
in the case of independent multiple discoveries. When approximately the same ideas or findings are independently communicated by a scientist of great repute and by one not yet widely known, it is the first we are told who ordinarily receives prime recognition. An, uh, an approximation uh, uh, to this pattern is reported by a laureate who observes it does not happen. Let me again quote it does not happen that two men have the same idea and one becomes better known for it. X suppose X uh, who had the idea went uh, circling round uh, to try to get an experiment for nobody would do it and so it was forgotten practically. Finally, A and B and C did it became famous and got the Nobel prize if things had gone just a little differently if uh, somebody had been willing to try the uh, experiment when X initially suggested it then they probably could have published it jointly and C or he would, would have been a famous man famous person as it is C or he is a footnote now. Okay? The, the originator of that idea has been reduced to a footnote. The workings of this process at the ex expense of the young scientist and to the benefit of the famous one is remarkably summarized in the life history of a laureate in physics who has experienced both phases at different times in her or his career. When you are, rec you are, when you are not recognized, she or he recalls it is a little bit irritating to have somebody come along and figure out the obvious uh, which you have already figured out and everybody gives her or him credit just because she or he is a famous physicist or a famous man in her or his field. Here she or he is viewing the case that uh, she or he reports from the perspective of one who had this happened to him before she or he had become famous. The conversation takes a new turn as she or he notes that her or his own position has greatly changed. Shifting from the perspective of her or his earlier days when she or he felt victimized by the pattern, so to the uh, so I mean I mean to the perspective of his present high status she or he goes on to say like this. Again let me quote, this often happens and I am probably getting credit now if I do not watch myself for things other people figured out because I am notorious and when I say it people say well she or he is the one that uh, thought this out. Well I may just be saying things that other people have already have thought out before. In the end then a sort of return hewn justice has been done by the compounding of two compensating injustices. Her or his earlier accomplishments have been underestimated, her or his later ones overestimated. This complex pattern of the misallocation of credit of scientific work most quite evidently be described as the Matthew effect. For as will be remembered the gospel according to St. Matthew puts it uh, uh, this way, for unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away uh, that uh, even that which he hath. I mean it is a biblical, it has a biblical origin uh, as we have already discussed uh, the, that uh, the gospel of Matthew uh, that, that that is a biblical uh, origin uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, that, that the term the Matthew effect is uh, the, the Matthew effect as put in less stately language. Okay? The Matthew effect consists in the accruing of greater increments of recognition for particular scientific contributions to scientists of considerable repute and the withholding of such recognition from scientists who have not yet made their mark. Nobel laureates often presumptive uh, I mean Nobel laureates provide presumptive evidence of the effect since they testified to its occurrence, not as victims which might make their testimony suspect, but as unwitting beneficiaries. The laureates and other eminent men, uh, individuals of science are sufficiently aware of this aspect of the Matthew effect to make special efforts to counteract. At the extreme, they sometimes refuse to co-author a paper reporting 
research on which they have collaborated in order not to diminish the recognition accorded their uh, less known uh, or less well known associates. And as Harriet Zuckerman has found they tend to give first place in jointly authored papers to one of their collaborators. She discovered, Zuckerman discovered moreover that the laureates who have attained eminence before receiving the Nobel Prize begin to transfer first authorship to associates earlier than less eminent laureates to be to do and that both sets of laureates the previously eminent and not so eminent greatly increase this practice after receiving the prize. Yet the latter effort I mean after receiving the prize latter effort is probably more expressive of the laureates good intentions than it is effective in addressing the imbalance of credit attributable to uh, the Matthew effect. As the laureate quoted by uh, Zuckerman acknowledges if I publish my, my name first then everyone thinks the others are just technicians. If my name is last people will credit me anyway for the whole thing so I want the others to have a bit more glory. The problem of achieving a public identity in science may be depended by the great increase in the number of papers with several authors in which the role of young collaborators becomes obscured by the brilliance that surrounds their illustrious co-authors who are senior to those junior authors. So great is this problem that we are tempted to turn again to the scriptures to designate the status en enhancement and status suppression components of the Matthew effect. We can describe it as the I mean if you can look at this uh, I mean it will surely have been uh, noted that the laureates perceive Matthew effect uh, primarily as a problem in the just allocation of credit for uh, scientific accomplishments. They see it largely in terms of its action in enhancing rank or suppressing recognition. They see it as leading to an unintended double injustice in which unknown scientists are unjustifiably victimized and famous ones uh, unjustifiably benefited. In short they see the Matthew effect in terms of a basic in inequity in the reward system that affects the careers of individual scientists, but it has other implications for the development of science and we must shift our angle of theoretical vision in order to identify them. Okay? Then Merton while dwelling upon inequalities in science he moved on to the Matthew effect in the communication system. Okay? We have already discussed the Matthew effect in uh, in the reward system. Now, let us see uh, the Matthew effect in the communication system. Okay? Now, let us look at the same social phenomena from, from the perspective of the communication system not from the standpoint of individual carriers and the workings of uh, the reward system, but from the standpoint of science conceived of as a system of communication. And this perspective yields a further set of in, in inferences. It leads us to propose the hypothesis that a scientific contribution will have greater visibility in the community of scientists when it is introduced by a scientist of high rank than when it is introduced by one who has not yet made his or her mark. In other words, considered in its implications for the reward system, the Matthew effect is dysfunctional for the careers of individual scientists who are penalized in the early stages of their development, but considered in its implications for the communication system the Matthew effect in cases of collaboration and multiple discoveries. May it then it may operate to heighten the visibility of new scientific communications. This is not this is not the first instance of a social patterns being functional for certain aspects of a social system and dysfunctional for certain uh, individuals within that system that indeed is a principal theme of, of classical tragedy according to Merton. Several laureates have 
sensed this social function of the Matthew effect. Speaking of the dilemma that confronts the famous individual of science, person of science who directs the work of a junior associate, one of them observes. Let me quote here, it raises the question of what you are to do. You have a student, should you put your name on that paper or not? You have contributed to it, but it, is it better that you should not or should? There are two sides to it. If you do not and here comes the decisive point on visibility, if you do not there is the possibility that the paper may go quite unrecognized, nobody reads it. If you do, it might be recognized, but then the student does not get enough credit. Okay? Studies of the reading practices of scientists indicate that the suggested possibility nobody reads it is something less than sheer hyperbole. hyperbole. It has been found for example, that only about half of 1 percent of the articles published in journals of chemistry are read by any one chemist according to Merton and much the same pattern has been found to hold in psychology again according to Merton. I mean how, how it, I mean, let me quote here the data on current readership that is within a couple of months after distribution of the journal suggested that about one half of the research reports in core journals will be read or skimmed by 1 percent or less of a random sample of psychologists. At the highest end of the current readership distribution, no research report is likely to be read by more than about uh, 7 percent of such a sample. Okay. Several of the Cole's findings bear uh, tangentially on the hypothesis about the communication function of the Matthew effect. The evidence is tangential rather than central to the hypothesis since their data deal with the degree of visibility okay, of the entire corpus of each physicist's work in the national community of physicists rather than the visibility of particular papers within it. Still in gross terms, their findings are at least consistent with the hypothesis. The higher the rank of physicists as measured by the prestige of the, the awards they have received for scientific work, the higher their visibility in the national community of physicists. Nobel laureates have a visibility score. Okay? Uh, other members of the National Academy of Science, a score of uh, they, 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 they are placed different, I mean they are placed with different scores, placed at different scores and this is how I mean awards, uh, uh, I mean I mean scientific awards in sciences uh, are carried out. I mean the Coles also find, find that the visibility of physicists producing work of high quality is heightened by their attaining honorific awards more prestigious than those they have uh, uh, previously received. Further investigation is required to discover whether these same patterns hold for differences in the visibility as measured by readership or individual papers published by scientists of differing rank. 